Good evening, everybody. Tonight on Let's Talk, we have one of the great voices of our industry um, in today. He's somebody who I have known for a long time, somebody whose work I've um, always responded to. And when I say respond, what I mean is when I see it popping up in a magazine or in an Instagram feed, I'm completely and utterly drawn to it because it's usually, it's not just about the hair, it's also about the entire imagery and it's just the thought behind it and the way it's, it, it, it manifests itself as a statement as opposed to just simply um, a, a, a hair concept that's been thought out and put out there. One of the other things I love about our guest tonight is he's, he's just so honest and forthright and he talks, he says it the way it is, um, which is quite refreshing in our industry. It's not always the case where um, people will say what they believe. He's also had the most incredible dynamic career. He's had a career that you know is so enviable in, in the sense of, 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 of the things he's done, he's been, um, and just the opportunities and, and, and just some of the great things that, 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 that he's been part of creating. So for me, um, getting inside Nick Irwin's mind tonight is going to be very, very simple because um, he's, you know, he, he's, he's very open and will talk openly, but also more importantly than that, he's got so many great things to say. Now, I have a bit of an issue with Nick tonight because I'm going to have to keep, keep him under control because even though he, 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 he will talk a lot to us, he tends to talk a lot more to people who he admires as opposed to talking about himself. So if we can get Nick to talk a little bit more about his own career, Give me a second because I'll mess up my thing. Meanwhile, he's wrecking the house. Are you, are you having a domestic with your wife there? <laughs> no, I've got this new, I, I've got this new thing which oh, I can't get it to... Wait, give me one second. <laughs> now, every time I see Nick at a show or somewhere, he's usually in the middle of chaos. He's usually, oh, I've got, I, was, I was meant to be somewhere 10 minutes ago or I've got to be here. And it's exactly the same. So... How are you? Can you see me? Am I okay? You look amazing, mate. You look great. Sorry about that. How you? <laughs> how are you? Well, I mean, as you saw me, that ain't that coming on there like that. <laughs> that is. That's the best. That's been the best opening we've had on Let's Talk since we've started. You know what it is as well, because I'm like, I, like I've, I've spent ten minutes sort of trying to get it right and think right tonight. I'm with Paul. You know, I've got nothing but respect. I've got to be really professional. <laughs> <laughs> and what do I do? I come on and I, and I right away, I'm upset, I'm like an idiot. But, um, anyway. Do you know, Nick, I have to tell you before we start, the comments that we have had um, from people when they knew you were coming on has been, has been pretty phenomenal. I mean, I have to say, we've had some great guests on here, but when, when we announced that you were coming on, people were instantly sending me messages telling me how they can't wait to hear what you have. And I think a lot of that's down to the fact that even though you, you're quite willing to talk, you generally let your work speak for itself. So I think that's a huge test. Now, I'm not going to give you compliments all night, by the way. Oh, well, I like them. So, you know, it's really kind of you. I appreciate it. <laughs> so for me, one of the things that I wanted to start with is when we go back on your career, all the way back, what, what was the pivotal point in your life? where you thought, I'm going to do hair for, my, for, for, for the rest of my life. What was the point where you thought, this is what I want to do? I think the first, I think the first Saturday I started in the salon, I think I, I'd gone from, you know, my dad got me a job at this local salon where we, in, in the city we lived. And, um, and it was like the best salon there and it was trendy and, and I was really intimidated. I was like, 13, 14 years old, going in there as a Saturday boy and thinking I was sort of, a, I suppose, fashionable at the time, you know, it was kind of, I was just trying to think back to what I was wearing. But I remember, I remember going in there and thinking, this is just incredible. I was working with all the people, really beautiful people, people that looked fantastic in the way that they dressed. Um, there was something really majestic about the, the buzz in the salon and the way people did hair and and it was just the whole kind of, looking back, it was the atmosphere. And so I think the kind of day one, I was hooked, Paul. It was sort of, that was the point when I thought, you know, and also to be honest with you, I think that time, in, you know, being at school, 
I mean, I, I, I was probably like a lot of kids out there. I hated school. I really didn't like it. And I, I, there was only a few lessons that I excelled at that I really loved, which was, was art um, and, and music. Because obviously my, my, with my, my father being a musician, being a drummer, and I played guitar and, and other things. So there was, that was the sort of drive. But I, what's really interesting, I've never really told anybody this. My, when I was... I. I Towards the end of my time at school, when they do your cur curriculum, they, uh, they sort of said, well, mine came out to be either a, hair a hairdresser, which obviously I am, or a farmer. <laughs> 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 so, like... And what sort I mean, of agricultural uh, experience did you have to make them think that? I don't know. I mean, I think growing up, I, sort of, I used to work on a farm at the weekends. I used to... I used to work for this local farm because my parents lived, we, had, we, we, we were sort of brought up at that time around the Scottish borders in a city called Carlisle. And um, so it was, right, it was right in the countryside. I mean, we were, we were right next to, it was Cumbria. And um, so I, I, I sort of, you know, worked, worked on a farm as a, as a, on a weekend and helped milk the cows and do all that stuff. And, and I absolutely loved it. So maybe it was something to do with the fact that I'd had that, you know, that experience, but... I'm kind of glad I, I'm kind of glad I became a hairstylist, a hairdresser. Now, I don't want to move too far forward, but there is something about what you said there that I think has had an impact on the work that you've produced over the last 30 years. You've always had this deep rooted understanding of subcultures, street culture, youth culture. You've got that kind of natural kind of um, magnetism towards that slightly raw or more underbelly of what's going on in the industry or what isn't going on in the industry. Was that already existing when you went into Herbest? And were you, were you example, for example, part of a tribe or were you into that sort of thing? I, th I, think, I think most kids are part of tribes, Paul. And I certainly think in them days, we were more tribal than, than we are today. I think we, we, we tended to stick to our, our sort of gang, our, our tribe as such. Um, I think tribe gets really overused now and, and, and it's sort of a bit of a trendy word. Um, but, you know, you'll know as well as I do that certainly at that age of sort of, you know, your, your sort of teens and you're finding out about music and, 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 and sort of, you know, what sexual orientation you are and clubbing and, and all the fabulous things like, and the awful things I've got with being a teenager, but the fabulous things and, and, and they... To me, especially where I grew up, because at that time, there was only really a couple of sort of cool nightclubs that played the certain kind of music that I was into. And, and I remember going to this one particular club. It was in a, it was only, I think it was a Wednesday night. It was a, it was a club called The Twisted Wheel. And it was like a, it was like a goth night. But they played like <laughs> lots of different music there. It was kind of like they would play, you know, sort of, elements of punk, there was this sort of new romantic thing, which were on the back of that, because it was the sort of mid, mid to early eighties. Um, you know, there was, there, was, there was, it was really eclectic. There was lots of, it was really interesting because the, 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 when, you, when you did the promo for tonight and you talked a little bit about Chris Sullivan, the book that you, you were reading, mm -hmm. uh, that you've been reading, and it was, a, it was a friend of yours. I was a huge fan of Blue, Mon, uh, Blue Ronda La Turk that he was in. And, and there was a song, and I was trying to think about it. We spoke earlier, and, um, and it was called Clato V16. I can't say the word. Do you remember that? Do you remember that track? Yeah, of course, yeah. Well, that, that, that was a real, they, they were the types of, they were the tracks that were being played at the time. And I think there was, a, there was this real eclectic thing of kind of the way people were dressing. I, I can't really say I, I belong to punk or sort of, you know, a mod or, or whatever it was that was happening, you know, skinheads, you know, any of that stuff. I, I kind of think when, when I, it was, it was sort of mid eighties. So it was kind of like we were influenced by the new romantics to an extent, but I think we slightly dressed a bit more, a slightly tougher version up North. We didn't, I think, you know, I, I tried to get away with wearing makeup and, 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 you know, ended up being on the wrong side of a fist a few times. Uh, and, <laughs> Because it was a tough town where we came from. It was it was all about that, and and um, but you know you persevere, and it, it was it was special. And and I think the hairdressing sort of salon at the time. I I, I used to hang with this 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 guy Chris. Uh, 
who was a gay guy who who really sort of I was kind of sort of I was obsessed with him and probably like a lot of maybe boys out there maybe boys don't always admit this but I'm I'm quite honest about this stuff I, I think there's a point where I was I probably wasn't sure whether I was straight or gay mm -hmm. because I was so into the way he was the way he dressed um, the clothes you know the He's, the way he did hair, the music he was into. Um, but then, you know, but then obviously, you know, I realized what, what, um, what my sexual preference was when I, when I got my first girlfriend. But, but yeah, so I think, I think going back to that question, is that that is definitely, I think, a part of a lot of our, you know, growing up as teenagers, it's that you draw on those subcultures. And I think I've always sort of kept it in the back of my mind that I think coming from that part of the world, and feeling a little bit isolated from, say, cities like London or Manchester, uh, you know, that I was really heavily influenced, obviously, from music and, and, and obviously the States, but, but more from, from the British culture. Um, and I think throughout my career, I've always tried, uh, I suppose, really to tap into that stuff and to always... And to always, because I think it can be a little bit cliche. I think we talked about this earlier. I don't want to sound like nostalgic because I'm, I'm sort of getting older now. But I think you, you can't help uh, sort of draw on those references and, and, and pay homage to them as you, as you become more, um, as, you, as you become more knowledgeable, as you become more, more experienced in what you do. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, uh, you know to just roll it back a little bit, <clears throat> I mean, for, for me, uh, being in Belfast at the time, London literally was the epicenter of everything that we could. We thought, we thought if it wasn't in the space or the ID magazine, it wasn't important. That's right. And, you know, and I, I was always drawn to London. But when you go back to what you, what, where you were in Carlisle and stuff, was the draw to get to London to work for, uh, from a very early stage? Or did yeah. you, I'll pop up and down there, but this is where I'm going to be for the rest of my life. I think it was my first, my first visit initially with the salon. We went to the event that used to be at the GMX in Manchester. And I remember seeing, I remember seeing Simon Forbes and Antenna on their stand. And I remember seeing them do a show and it kind of blew my mind. And I thought that, and I think I was into things like, like certainly some of the pop culture music, I was I like Dead or Alive. I was into sort of like King and bands like that that were that were pop but were brilliant. And 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 I remember seeing Simon Forbes and his team and thinking and had these amazing warlocks and the, the, the kind of extensions and they just looked so fucking cool. And I was like, wow. Just, I, the, and realizing that they were from London, they weren't from Manchester. Um, so there was that kind of thing of thinking that was that was my sort of taste of how do I get to that point? Or how do I get to those people? How do we, how do I, you know, embrace that sort of world that they, that they seem to live in? Um, and what, and I didn't go straight away. I, I went by Newcastle. I went, I went, I, I worked with, um, in them days, to sort of, to, in the eighties, we, I, I then went to work for um, Saks and it was Gary Hooker at the time uh, who had, the Sax franchise in Newcastle. This is before he went on, he went on his own and obviously before he met Michael. Um, and we were very close. I worked for him for a few years and, and got my first taste of, of sort of traveling up and down the country with him, doing sort of hair shows. And, and we, did some, we did some shoots as well, if I think back. Early days of shooting with Clinal, I think it was, um, with a guy called Martin Evening. I don't know if you remember him. I remember. Sort of hair, Martin, who was a great hair photographer. Uh, we worked with Harold Layton, um, stuff like that, and that was that. So that was exciting, and and and, and then it was I, Gary. will tell you this if you ever speak to him. You know, he, I, I sort of then was, was starting to get obsessed with Anthony Muscolo. I was sort of <laughs> we'd been to Salon International, and uh, I remember them doing, and I can't, I think it was eighty eight maybe, and they did this thing which was all they're all in Catherine Hanna, the models, and they brought these. I remember it like it was yesterday. They had these sort of, they were almost like um, these screens that were on wheels that they brought on. I suppose a little bit like, um, what's those things you make when you're a kid with wheels on? What's the name for it? You know, you make it as a kid. <laughs> yeah, like a skateboard, but you sit on it. It's like a buggy. There's a, I don't know what they called them in, in Northern Ireland, but anyway, it was almost like a pram type sort of thing. But anyway, they, and I remember them 
projecting images onto it and I and doing the coolest haircuts and I, and the the way that they dressed and so that was it that was kind of like a bit of a fascination to then try and work towards joining Tony and Guy and 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 being with somebody like you know trying to get well to, as close to Anthony as, as possible um and, and, and that was and that was yeah so that was kind of a, a sort of a you know that was the draw to London I suppose at that time I mean, I mean, Anthony at that time was God. I mean, you know, mm. we all idolised him. He, he was good. You know, he was the head of this incredible artistic team. But there was a distance between him and, you know, the rest of the world. You managed to get right up beside him and work for a very, very long time. What was that process like? What did you have to do to get to the point where he was turning around to you and saying, you do this, you're the man? You know, what's the, um, what was that? I mean, Anthony's a very, Anthony's very, um, he's an incredible, he's like a Pied Piper, Anthony. He's got a great, he sort of spots talent. He, he nurtures it. He, he kind of feeds off, he surrounds himself with talent. He surrounds himself with really talented people, whether, not just hairstylists either, that in all walks of life, he, he has a great sort of, a, a sort of media group of people that he's close to that are all excelling what they do. And, um, I think really was probably, I, I remember doing a show in Australia. I was living in Australia. I went to, 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 be, to be part of Tony and Guy in Australia in the early 90s uh, with a guy called Dennis Langford. And we did a show there um, in Sydney for Hair Expo. And the show at the time, and, and Mike Issa came out, who was a choreographer. And his wife, funny enough, was in the show as well. I remember Caroline and, and Anthony, Sasha, myself, Gary France. Um, and we, something happened on that trip. It was like, apart from us getting messed up every night and having fun and partying and, and doing all <laughs> the things that, that we did in them days, we, a real bond happened, a real sort of, it was like this little gang. And even though there was this strong, incredible art team back in London, there, there was something happened, and 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 and, and also I think you know the the I think because I did an interview the other day and I talked about this. I sort of said you know you should find a mentor or find somebody you idolise and copy them and try and be them because if you do that, there's a fine chance that you'll get if you get close to that, at least you'll have some kind of you know contentment in what you do and, and what you produce. And I think that was really my goal. It was never. I mean, I wasn't a stalker or anything stupid like that where I was, I was just respectful like any other hairdresser. I'm probably a cheeky little bastard as well and, and, and cocky, you know, as you can, as, as people that know me, I, I, you know, that's, I'm not scared of, of sort of you know, speaking my mind. But so I think all of those traits he liked. And, and I think obviously coupled with the fact that I could do, I could do, you know, good hair, um, you know, without sounding without sort of blowing my own trumpet. And, and, and very much there was an aesthetic at Tony and Guy then. And I think you either, you either got it, even if you were in the art team, you either understood what we were trying to do as a brand, as a company, as, a, as this force in hairdressing, um, or you didn't. And I think the ones that didn't, that tried to rock the boat and maybe become, be, be a little bit sort of, you know, push, push the wrong ideas through, they tended to leave and become session workers. Um, you know, there were some great people at that stable. I mean, obviously Guido was part of that whole thing early on in the, in the sort of, you know, the, in, well, the, certainly the mid nineties. Uh, and a lot of the art team used to go and assist him and do shows. And so that was very influential, but a lot of guys left to, you know, Malcolm, Ed, Ma Malcolm, um, Edwards. Malcolm Edwards was there, Alan Pichon, uh, there was some super, uh, Paul Hanlon, who was, uh, who's a brilliant hairstylist and he's one yeah. of the new, well, I say new, he's, he's, you know, compared to some of us older guys, he's the one that's really killing it out there as well for, for his age. Um, I love what Paul does. And, and so, yeah, so, the, so it was a hotbed of talent. And I, and I think, you know, going back to sort of working with, with Anthony, I think when I returned to London, um, we, that was where the sort of, the, the, I don't want to call it a partnership, but the, the friendship really started to kind of happen. Well, and we became super close. It was a collaboration because, and I want to wind it back a little bit because I, I want to refresh your memory. First of all, the Tony and Guy art team at that time were, were probably the most progressive of all the art teams in the world. Not only were they doing the strongest, most innovative, most exciting work, 
but every single individual on that team was recognised by name, and they looked amazing. The team looked amazing. And the one thing that I always yeah. remember when watching you guys at Sound International was that you all had an identity. They weren't zoned. Up to that point, our teams all looked like each other. Well, you yeah. guys you all had your own look. And people recognised you by name. They, there's Nick, there's Ian, there's Gary. Yeah, you know? yeah. But it was a rock and roll lifestyle. Well, I mean, what, explain, try to sort of quantify what that was like, living that life. Well, well, I think, you know, it, it was sort of, I mean, and everybody that was in it, in it was, was doing it. I mean, it was, it was, I mean, we talked about this a little bit earlier. It was kind of, you know, the back end of Britpop, you know, it was all that stuff going on. You know, it was very hedonistic. London was thriving. It was fired up again. There was, there was obviously the, the, the sort of dancing culture on the back of that. There was then the, all these places opening up like the Atlantic and, and the Met Bar and, and all these where, where you could go and hang out with like, you know, I don't know, that you could be there one night and you'd be next to Liam Gallagher. And it was just, it was just madness. And, it, and it, so you, it, you, it sort of rubbed off on you. And, and also there was the sort of, the, the stuff that went with it, the, you know, the partying and, 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 uh, and, and everybody did it. I mean, you know, if, you know I'm, I mean, I'm not gonna name names, but it was part of, it fueled <laughs> what we were doing, Paul. I mean, uh, and, and, but one thing that I'll say, and I'll, I'll never glamorize that stuff because what, we, what it did do, I think we always knew there was, a line, there was a fine line where you knew not to cross it in terms of the work came first. The work was so important. We were so obsessed with what we were doing. Mm -hmm. We were always about pushing it up, pushing the envelope. So, so that, that element of obsessiveness and, and not, and scared to fuck up, pardon my, pardon my language, that you, you, you know, you didn't, you didn't go past, you didn't go overboard. And, and I think you kept it, you kept it together. I mean, it was a rocky road, don't get me wrong. You know, there was times when, you know, you would get on a stage and you hadn't been to bed from the night mm -hmm. before, but, but I don't think it ever came across like that because we were so driven and we were so passionate and it was a, it was a really powerful time. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the, the exciting thing for us was it was something to emulate. You know, uh, being in Belfast and building salons and teams, we used to look at the art team take to the stage at the British Hairdressing Awards and everyone was thick with envy because they looked like the coolest most in it people they, they they had the look and the work you guys were producing but by the early 2000s mid 2000s you had created your own identity i mean obviously tony and guy for you but you created your own identity within that organization or and the tg organization and that was one of the first you're one of the first people to do that that encouraged or that's something did yourself because the Nick Irwin for TG and Bedhead became a thing. I mean, I, I mean, it's great you say that. I mean, it's, I mean, I, it's, it's, I mean, I think for me, looking back on it, you know, you now that you say it, I, I mean, I think it was happening, but it went, I probably wasn't that conscious of it, Paul. I think, I think, you know, I was fortunate that I was given because I, I, I left when I left Tony and Guy to pursue session. Uh, for, for about three or four years, there was a period where I was just totally freelance. Um, and, and, then I, and then when I went back, and then I, I'd missed, you know, and then Anthony obviously offered me the position of coming back in to do the TG thing with him. Um, and it was just me and him and Pat and, and, and Alex Baron Howe, who's, who's, on, who's watching us tonight, who's a great friend of mine, I love him to bits, who's a, who was a young boy that came to the salon and got his hair cut and he's now a great photographer and you know, he's one of the main guys there at TG now and pretty much yeah. runs the show there. But do you know Alex? He's fantastic. Yeah. He's, he's great. Um, it was just those guys. And, and, and so we, we were, it was like starting all over again. And, and it, was, it was fresh and it was, it was exciting. So when we were producing images, say, for the brand in America, for Anthony's brother Bruno and his wife Kyra, um, you know, we kind of had freedom to do not what we wanted because there was a brand aesthetic and there was a brand there was a formula to, to the bedhead thing and, and which was kind of the way me and Anthony did hair or, or the hair that Anthony did and I had probably adopted and maybe made my own a little bit. Um, but I think it was, there was a lot of freedom, Paul. He, he, I, you know, I've got to, I've got to, I can't, you know, say enough good stuff about Anthony because he let me, 
he, he let me really run run a bit loose with he gave me the reins early on and and um and and let me sort of express and certainly not just through the haircuts but a lot of the stuff we were working Vivian Westwood was right next to us in Battersea. We were working with them a lot. We became very close to them. We had a great relationship. Um, so we were doing sort of collaborations and using their claws. And, and it was just a great time. It was, it was, it was fabulous. And it was, but, uh, but on the back of it, we were building a product. We were driving a product for a company yeah. that was becoming a household name. So it, it was powerful. It was powerful stuff. But your transition from educator and brand ambassador to session status was seamless. Now that's actually nearly impossible in this industry. Mm. Session stylist and educator are two completely different animals. But your transition was, um, as I said, see, tell us a little bit about how that happened. Well, it's interesting because I got into, I started, a, I started when I was younger. I left Tony and Guy, I was in my sort of late twenties. And I kind of thought, you know, I wanted to have a crack at it and, and sort of started to do it. It was really difficult. Like I was skin all the time, feast of famine. Then obviously went back to TG and, and, and I went back to work with Anthony and, and did that bit. And then, and then towards the end of my time with those guys, Unilever had bought TG. Um, I'd kind of become, I sort of, I was sitting on the board of directors. I was the global creative director. I had everything that you could wish for in terms of, you know, traveling and money and, and all the stuff that went with it. And it was, a, you know, it was great. But I was really unhappy and I was, I was starting to lose the, the, the love for the creative stuff within that company. And what I was really enjoying was I'd been asked by Unilever stroke TJ at the time would I consider doing going back into the fashion industry and doing shows again, uh, which I'd sort of done a little bit of in the early 2000s. And I was like, yeah, you know, we were, we were also sponsoring other people. We were like Paul Hanlon and other great, you know, Anthony Turner and other people. But I think for me at the time, being the global credit director of the brand and, you know, we felt it was like, we had a brand called Catwalks. So it was like, a, it was a no brainer that we went out and, and did it ourselves. And, and motivated our own people and made it more authentic. And so while that was all happening and we were doing, you know, 18 shows a season, you know, from New York to London, etc. Uh, we, one of the designers I worked with in London happened to be shooting for the first or second issue of Hunger Magazine. Um, and Rankin, who I'd knew, I'd known for, since the 90s, we'd done some work with him in the, in the sort of late 90s and he'd become a good friend of Anthony's and, and stuff. Um, he, he um, I, went, I went and did the hair for the, for the shoot and we reconnected and it was like, you know, then he was like, look, you know, I'd love you to work with me a bit more. And, and I was, you know, absolutely, ob ob I couldn't believe it. It was like, it was, you know, and it was everything I, what I was missing. And I, the energy that I was getting from those, those days shooting with him were way more the highs than what I was getting still when I was going back to sort of doing my, I was wearing lots of different hats, Paul. I was sitting <laughs> on a board. I was running, I was traveling all over the world. I was doing shows. I was doing seminars. I, I had, you know, a huge team underneath me. It was, it was, it was fab. I had Anthony, who was obviously consulting at the time to the company after selling it. Um, but so there was all this pressure. It, it was, it was crazy. And, and I think, the, the sort of creativity and, and the, 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 the draw, the, the passion, the love, the, all those things that I've been, you know, talking about really came out when I worked with Rankin. And, 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 and I think all the things that I sort of tried to do, whether it was for, for the brands that I was working with, I was doing it for real. Does that make sense? I was, it was like the real deal. And, and I think to get, to get the sort of, you know, to get that, recognition all i wanted to do i didn't care about anybody else all i wanted to do was rank into to approve what i was doing if i had his approval after being such a again a massive fan from a young age of, of buying days the right at the very 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 beginning and pretty much have all of every single copy in the house still i mean i'm you know obsessive about stuff like that um so to have him there and, and sort of and then creating this sort of friendship and this this creative thing that we that he 
And he was a bit, I suppose in a way there was similarities with Anthony where he was letting me do things and I was starting to develop my own style with it. And, and you know, one thing with him, he, he would always, and he still says this to me now after all those years, is like, he's, you know, he, he always says to me, do not do Tony and Guy hair for me on these shoots. I don't want to say it. <laughs> and that's no disrespect to Tony and Guy or TG or anything like that because there's a different aesthetic, there's a different type of hair that gets well, done. Let me stop you there, Nick, because I wanted to speak to you about that very specifically because the, the, the distinguishing point in your career where people took notice of you was things like, obviously, Days to Hunger magazine, where they seen this side of you that they could never have seen before. And that the most interesting aspect of your career, because it's a little bit like Elvis stopping mid-career and going, you know something, I'm not doing rock and roll anymore. I'm, I'm doing gospel. Gospel. It was that obvious. Where, where did that mindset come from? I mean, where, where, at what point did you stop thinking, salon, create industry, I'm going to step outside that. I, I'm, I'm, this is not industry um, I think, I think what, get, when I was doing the shows again and working with designers and, and, and working around getting sort of that, tapping into that aesthetic and that, that those tiny details of things that just would go above most people's heads and learning or relearning that, reawakening that stuff that was in my head, going back to researching properly and researching, I'm not just talking about looking at a couple of hair magazines or, or you know, getting turned on by a couple of fashion advertising campaigns you like. I'm talking about really researching and spending weeks and weeks and weeks on diving deep into subjects and, and learning about the historical element of it and, and how it, where it, that comes from. And so all of that stuff. And I think, you know, and, and the pressure of it, you know, the, the pressure of coming up with something that was, that would, that would excite what, say ranking was doing with hunger at the time and still is where the industry I, I think also you know being close to I mean having a friendship with people like Eugene or 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 you know those guys or you know people like Paul Hanlon who have gone you know it's incredible you know brilliant hairdressers that I really admire love what they do you know thinking well you know if I'm doing hair I've got it I've got it if I'm gonna step outside that the hair bubble as such I've, I've got to be, the, I can't be doing, I can't be doing that hair and them to take me seriously. Mm. Um, and, I, and I think I've got to be careful, Paul. I want, I want to just sort of, because I, with anybody who listens to this and, you know, I've got nothing but, and I'll always, you know me really well. I, I've got nothing but admiration for everybody I've ever worked with. And I, I respect them immensely when it comes to hair. Um, and, I, you know, I love Sasha, I love Tony and Guy, I love, I love everything. That, they're, they're right on the pulse of what's going on. With their, with, their, with their sort of connection to the fashion world. So I'm, I'm certainly not putting any of that down. What I'm talking about is that formulation of what the way we were educating and, and that sort of hairdressing picture of, you know, this is your shot, it's kind of head on. Um, you've got that much, fr you know, frame round the, round the head. It's, it's, all, it's like, the, like what you see when you go to judge the competition. I mean, yes. it's changing, but it's that formulated stuff. And I think to try and just come out of that and do things like an emoji head yeah. and take the piss out myself a little bit and do something where you're shooting the back of the head and people go, well, that's not a hairstyle. And people are ringing me up going, you've lost the plot, mate. Why are you doing that shit? <laughs> but and I, get, and I still get it, Paul. The interesting thing about all this, the exciting stuff is, and this is where I think people might miss the point, and, and I get what you're saying about your respect for Tony and Guy, and we all... We all have a lot to thank them for. But what happened with you was, all of a sudden the hair that you started to do started to say more about the people in the picture than just the haircut. And, and, and going back to your emoji head, it's that tongue Banksy element of it, where people look at, well, that's just beautifully executed, so witty, yet it's well done and it's made me smile. That is an aesthetic that doesn't come to everyone. And, and for me, when I look at the type of hair you're talking about, that's the sort of thing that makes me excited about it. But it's a small part of the industry. 
that you're part of. And yeah. it's very specialist. How difficult is it to get into that area you're now part of? I think it's really hard. I think, I think it's, it's um, you, you've got to be given, I, I kind of fast tracked it a little bit. I, in, in, and when I say fast tracked it, I've been hairdressing a long time, but I'm relatively new at the session game in terms, if you look at other people, if you look at other big hairstylists, that's, you know, they, they've, they've done it for, you know, 20, 30 years. I mean, I, I'm talking about session. Um, whereas, you know, I think I think I think a lot of it comes to do with it, with my my sort of knowledge and experience and and like I said to you earlier, just that sort of that thing of digging and 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 always trying to look at something and you know I I there's a great thing on and peop, some people might disagree with me here but there's a great thing on Instagram called um, uh, um, oh, it's, it's slipped my mind Prada it's the um, West, what's it called on Instagram? And it's basically, they give their view. They, they, they kind of look at when you've sort of copied somebody or their Diet Prada, Diet Prada. I don't know if you follow them, Paul. Do you no, follow I, them? I, you should have a look at their account, right? And they've done some really interesting stuff over the last few days, especially with everything that's been going on with, uh, with all the race, you know, the race situation around the world. But what's interesting with that is that I, I've got this paranoia of somebody find like, calling me out of saying you've copied that that's come from them or you've nicked that idea from Eugene or you've nicked that idea from Angelo or you've done this from him or and and so there's that thing of and my and any, like my assistants that work with me now or the team that work around me will tell you that the first thing we do when we're coming up with something is you know is has it been seen if it has how do we make it ours? How do we put our stamp on it? What, how do we make it us? How, how, does, it, how does it start to have your, your kind of feel and, and, and energy? Um, and it's not easy. It's, it's not easy. It's, 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 it's quite tricky. And I think that's, if you speak to most hairstylists that do what I do, mm. they'll all say the same thing. That's what they're all striving to do. Yeah. Um, so I suppose I'm lucky in the environment that I don't, you, I mean, I do a lot of commercial work that you would never see. That I do a ton of stuff with Rankin and a few other. But I only work with a handful of people, by the way. I don't work with a massive amount of photographers. Like there's, 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 you know, four, maybe five people that I work with, but predominantly Rankin. Um, let's say, for instance, you know, I do a lot of advertising for brands, so I have to do very um, sort of, you know, hair that's very commercial sometimes. Um, so the, I can't always do the. The emoji stuff. I mean, that's a that's these are for like you know the, the sort of moments when I'm doing a hair story for maybe hunger or or it's something like that. But um, but I think there that's the time when you've really got to try and get it right, Paul. You've got to you're given that platform, so it's like you're only going to get one crack at it. And yeah. and and I think this day and age, you're on you're, we're we're all unsure. Every day we do what we do, like what we're doing now, mm. what we're saying what we're putting on Instagram, the way that we're communicating. You, you, it's not like it used to be where somebody could say, oh yeah, I know Chris Sullivan and I did this and I parted with him and I went to that mm. club and did... people know that you, they can find out super quick. That's right. So you can't, so you have to be, so it's the same with the hair thing. You know, we have to be, you have to do something that, you know, and I might get an idea. I might look at, you know, I don't know. I might look at what Eugene's done for my genre and think, fucking hell, I wish I'd thought of that. Or I love that bit he's done there with the colour. How do I get that into what I'm doing? And, and, but then I know when I do it, even yeah. if I try and copy it, it's going to not look like his. It's going to be something else. But plagiarism, which is what you're talking about, is something in our industry that, that people do get, they do get pulled up on it now. We, you know, it, it, it's not like the old days where people will just accept, well, that's a version of Pony and Guy haircut. People will say, yeah, but you didn't, Angelo did that first, or Eugene did that. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the thing that I feel in your field, the originality doesn't have the rules that the industry has. You, you, you literally do what you want within reason, because actually the, the scale of creativity and, and opportunity are more wider. Do you find that that's good for you, or do you find that more restrictive? There's more pressure on you because there's more expectation. I think it's. I think it depends which way you look at it. If you look at it from the hair industry, I think. I think. 
I don't have to rely on, you know, I don't have to rely on trying to win the British or, 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 or one of their categories. Well, that's what I mean. To, to profile me because it's, I don't really, I think when I left TG, I sort of consciously made an effort to sort of not turn my back on the hairdressing industry by any means. I just, I wanted a break. I wanted to just solely work on the session thing and not, and kind of almost sit under the radar. So now it's about the balance between that and what I do in the hair industry, which I'm sure we'll come to. Um, so I, I think, but when, but when it comes to all my fashion peers and the people that I work around um, that are critical beyond belief, <laughs> like you, 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 you make, you put a foot out of line or you do something that's even not the aesthetic that they, they'll just rip you apart. Mm. So there's always that, I mean, it's funny, I have this conversation with Ellie, my assistant, all the time, because she's, she's going through that transition at the moment where I'm sort of, I call it de-hairdressing, de de-hairdressing defying her, mm. defying her hairdressing, or whatever way you want to look at it. What I mean by that is to take and taking that salon thing away from her, looking at hair that, rather than it just being a hairstyle, it's about, it's beyond that. And it's about it, it becoming part of the story and it, and it becomes, it has a narrative to it and it has a, it has a, a reference which is could be super subtle. Could be just something about the hairline form. Could be it could be the way that you've curled the hair. It could be it could be just you know the way that even even a, a simple ponytail, but it's where it's placed. Yeah. And and just all of those things that go with it, which a lot of hairdressers will probably look at it and go, oh, it's boring. It's not really for me because they're very they're in this sort of and I get it. You know, I get it because that's the way that a lot of the hairdressing industry is. Um, so I, and I really admire that part as well. I admire the awards. I admire all the work and the effort and the energy and all that stuff that goes into it. Mm. But I just, you have, to, you have to use that mentality. You have to leave that mentality at the door when you walk into the studios that I walk into now mm. and think of it purely on a, on a, that you're there as part of a, a sort of a narrative that we're going to tell a story that day. Yeah. And it's about everything from the nail right down to who that girl is, who's the woman, who's the story, who's the boy, who's the guy. Is it, you know, it was, it's like, it's, it's all of it is going through your mind. And, and, and also, Paul, I think a lot of it is how you research. It's the research that you, the kind of, the, you know, the hours and hours and hours on end. I mean, my wife will tell you, you know, I, it's like my, my evenings or, or time when I'm not shooting is I'm buried in, 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 in the computer referencing and, and, you know, I mean, that's just part of it. So a few years ago, you, after what we've just been talking about and the fact that hairdressers are still orientated to winning awards and building Instagram accounts, you were invited to be a mentor to the fame team at the fellowship. Now, for me, that was one of the most, um, one of the most bravest things for the fellowship to do. Because, first of all, you came from a different aspect of the industry, and that was going to give these kids, um, that sounds a bit condescending, it was going to give these people an incredible opportunity to step outside the industry and see what's going on in the world um, in regards to fashion and, and working at a different level. But it wasn't going to make them into superstars like the normal formula would. How difficult was that for you to try to address those people? Um, well, I think, that, I think the fellowship were looking, I think, well, I say that, I think Bruno, who was the president at the time, sort of nabbed me at the hairdressing awards and was like, put me on the spot and said, look, do you want to do this? I think you'd be great for it. And I said to him, look, I'll do it on one condition. You've got to, I, you've got to let me do it my way. You know, I can't, I don't, I can't, I can't come in because I'm not the celebrity style hairdresser. I'm not that guy that the, I, I just don't have that. I'm, I'm not that person and, and um, I might have a bit of a name, but I still think that nobody knows who I am. I mean, I'm not, I don't really, I'm just that type of character. I don't, you know, um, so I, and he was like, look, absolutely. That's what we want you to do. Be amazing. So it was really when I came home and I remember speaking to Stacey, my wife, and we, I said, look, you know, how do I do it? I want to get them in front of my session friends to mentor them. I want to do things that are related to what I do now as a hairdresser. I want to try and get Rankin to shoot their camp, their pictures for them because they get to do a shoot. We have a bit of a budget for a shoot. Um, certainly, the budget certainly isn't Rankin's fee. Let me tell you that he did. <laughs> I mean, he did a massive favour. 
and like pretty much did that shoot for free for me for three years for those kids. Um, and I've, and I, I've absolutely, I owe him for the rest of my life. I mean, I, I adore him for it. So that's, what, that's what's so brilliant about him. But I think for me, Paul, it was looking at how can we give them something different? I didn't want the four of them by the end of that year to look back on it and think, I'm just going to go back to what I was doing before. I wanted to, even if, even if, even if I challenged them and made them feel uncomfortable and put them in situations where they, they probably didn't really want to do it, it, it's an experience that they'll never forget. Mm -hmm. um, and you learn from your mistakes and you, so there was all of that stuff. The first year was, I felt really sorry for them because I got ill. Um, I, 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 I sort of, I got this thing that, I mean, I found out I was diabetic in the November and then in the January when I started working with the uh, fame team, we were on a trip to Dubai and I got really sick, didn't come out of my hotel room, I ended up in hospital, came back to London, ended up sort of being ill for a few months. Um, and nearly, you know, I, I mean, to the point where I could have died. I mean, looking back on it, it was crazy. Um, but so the kids went through this really weird, when I say the kids, the kids because they're younger than me, you know, there was Jordana and, and James and Gavin, um, those guys. And, 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 uh, and when I think looking back, it, I felt sorry for them because they, I wasn't probably in, in that headspace I should have been. And, and uh, it wasn't until probably as I got better, physically stronger and started to shoot with, say, Rankin and put them in front of some of the session guys and that they kind of started to understand it. Mm. By then it was the end of the year and we'd moved on. But I, I think they enjoyed it. I think they enjoyed parts of it. There was, we, it, there was a few bumps and scrapes along the way. Um, but, you know, it, it, was, it was a learning curve. Yeah. The second year with the, with the Fame team was a game changer because... I, I got four of them that were, well, I mean, Ellie now is my first assistant who was on there, Ellie Bond. Paddy, who is a brilliant hairdresser, um, uh, super close to him. He's, he's, he's one of Duffy's main, main short team, works with Duffy, and already did when I got him. I mean, he was, he was already part of that world. So I can't, I can't sort of claim that I, I, I get, you know, I got him into that, but... But, he, but he, he understood what I was trying to do. And, and when you've got, there was those two, and there was, there was Casey from Tony and Guy. She was amazing, again, from a great stable. So she was so into it. Uh, Peter from Scotland. And, and, and so all of them, they were all very different, but all really into what we were doing. And so from day one, when you know you've got, it's like being in a band. When, when, the, when you're all playing your instrument and you're all playing it for the same reason, you, you're in that zone together, then it's easy to sort of take it wherever you want. It's like a jazz band. You can go off and you can, you know, experiment. And, and, and so there was that sort of mentality in there. It was great. And I was, I, a lot of, I know, what was hard to say for the past with the, some of the kids for the, for the fellowship was they would like, they would like the sort of 12 dates throughout the year in concrete, pretty much by February. This is what they're doing for the year. Well, I was doing things on a weekly basis. I would, I would find out that, right, I'm putting you in front of ranking next week or come and assist me on this shoot or blah, blah, blah. And then, I, and then to, to top it all off that, that year, which was amazing, I was, I was spending quite a lot of time with Eugene and, and we'd, I'd seen Eugene and I said to him, look, you can tell me to fuck off or you can, you can give them five minutes, have a coffee with them, do whatever. I'd love, I'd love you just to say hello to them. And he went, I'll tell you what I'll do for you. Bring them to Paris they can do Maison Maijola with me, Yoji Yamamoto, Tom Brown. Wow. And I was like, and I mean, I've got hairs on my, on my arms sticking up now thinking of it. And we took, we took them out. Paddy was already there. He was, he was, he was doing stuff with, in Paris with, with Duff. But just to be, I mean, you know, we even got to spend like a few days at my, Maison Maijola's headquarters and watching them prep that show. Because that's a three-day prep for that show. That's not just rocking up on the day and spending four hours on a look. That's like a hundred, 200 looks of, of hair and models and, and fittings and meetings. I mean, it's, it's mental. It's, and it was one of the, it was a life changing experience for them. And, and so I think all of that stuff um, really made me feel, made me feel proud, Paul, because it was, it was a, 
I felt I'd really ticked off something that had never been done before. Well, um, and then and then they persuaded me, Paul. They persuaded me to do another year, which was last year, uh, and we were building our new, our new brand and all of that stuff. And and we ended, and I met another four incredible incredible kids, uh, which again we've just had another fantastic sort of year with them up until up until last the beginning of this year. So it, it's been a bit of a um, it's been a great journey for me, and, and it also sort of got me really. I fell in, I fell back in love with the hair industry again. Yeah. Well, I think the thing that, that, that was very telling was how emotional you were on the stage of the fellowship. You could barely speak. I, I've been there when you've been doing the You're right. And you yeah. see the bond and the respect they have for you, but also the love you have for them. But uh, late last year, you started to announce on Instagram and social media your new babe, your new um, baby, new um, your new concept and project, and everybody was very intrigued. And it was just about to kick off, and we were just about to learn a lot more about it when this had happened. But now's your opportunity to explain to me. <laughs> What, 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 uh, well, just in a nutshell, it's a brand called Anti. It's a guy I, I, I'm, I'm part of it with a with a, there's, there's four people that are in it. Um, the, the guy, that, the founder, is a guy called Francesco Rugarino, who's Australian, who I've met many years ago when I was still part of TG, and he lives lived in Australia. He's got a great salon business called Premier, so he was in New York and and two salons in Sydney. So we sort of talked about this product thing and and and. And everything I sort of learned, all the things that I didn't want to do, say, that I've learned at maybe TG with the amount of products and, and being a session worker now and having a handful of products, I wanted to try and design something with them that would just be about no kind of bullshit and not pretending that you need 25 different things to make a look. It's like, you don't need to do that. And, and let's all, any hairdresser out there that knows what they're doing knows what I'm talking about. Um, so the whole idea was to sort of create something which had integrity, that aesthetically looked beautiful, um, and create something where nobody was over my shoulder telling us what to do and saying, the hair's got to look like this. This is how you're going to do education. It's like all comes from the, the heart and from the right place. So it's, it's baby steps. We, the brand's slowly building. We, we just opened a space in London, in Brixton. Um, which is a multifunctional space. So it's, it's, it's part salon where we, we do clients there. It's, it's, well, it's, it's Prema under the guise of Prema. Um, it also is a space where we shoot from or where, where we intend to shoot from. Uh, it's a seminar space. I mean, we spent, you know, it's, it's a great, we spent some, you know, a, a good amount on, on, on the setup, but it's very simple, honest space under the arches in Brixton. And Brixton, if you know Brixton, it's near where I live, Paul. So it's, it's kind of, it's part of me again. It's like this is sort of where we where we hang out, where we do our shopping in the market, and it's very it's very colourful. It's very um, you know it's not a it's not a there's nothing posh about it or sort of high end in any any way. But it's 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 exactly who I'm about as a person. And um, but unfortunately, like I said to you today on the phone, it's like you know this this has happened. We've just opened. Corona's happened, and you know it's and it's I'm like everybody else out there. I'm, I'm sort of praying that you know we can come out of this you know in a, in a good way and hopefully go back to it and build it and, and take it from there yeah i think the thing that i loved about it was just the simplistic intrigue leading up to it having said that it wasn't a bullshit thing it was actually just you know we're just going to drop this and let it happen or yeah which well, is I, I was look, i was lucky paul i got i, I got ranking shot the first campaign for me and, and really helped us with that and those images that if anybody saw them they were they were we wanted to do, I didn't want to do hairstyles. Mm. I wanted to do just beautiful pictures that we can hang in an art gallery. And that's what we did when we, when we did our opening night for the brand, when we, when we launched it here. We, just, we, we used a white gallery and we hung the pictures, we lit them beautifully. And some great people came along and, and we, you know, we, and it was about just sort of sharing the emotion and the experience of, of what these images do. And it was a bit like going to an art gallery and, and I'm not claiming that I'm an artist in, in any way. It's, it's, I'm not going to hate all that nonsense. Um, but, they, but there's something special about them. And, 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 uh, and so that was our sort of our, our kind of, you know, our little taste, if you like, to the industry. Um, and then, and then the, the thing that I'm really proud of is what we did, what we've just launched at the moment. I don't know if you've seen it on Insta, uh, which is the kids that we shot in New York. Um, we shot it last September. And... 
there were these through through one of the one of the young hairstylists that works for us in New York, a girl called Cheeky. Her, her this she had these most incredible friends, and I'd said to Frank, I want to shoot them. We've got to shoot these kids. They're they're so on it. They're like they they they're just so inspiring, and it, it's like they're the, they're the, it's the new now. It's like and. It's everything you'd want to be as a young sort of person out there, and they're, they're politically aware. They're, they're, you know, they're just, it's just everything about them is incredible. Anyway, so we've shot this thing, we interviewed it, the Hunger Magazine, you know, put it up on their, on their space for us. And, and so, yeah, so I'm proud of that. Cause, and it's not necessarily about, it's not necessarily about hair, Paul. Mm. It's about telling, a, it's a narrative, it's a story. It's about getting people looking at it and going, this is, these are inspiring and, and just sharing my, my love and passion for what we're doing. The very reason that I wanted to speak to you was about the stories you tell through the work you do. And obviously, we could go on all night talking about it. Unfortunately, Nick, we're coming to the end of the conversation. I knew it was going wow, to went quick. I have to say this to you. While we've been talking, the comments that have been coming in and, and the love that people have for you and what you've done, it's phenomenal. And I have to say, the passion comes through. It's very, very, we absolutely love what you've been doing. I can't wait to see what the future, and not just the future for Nick Irwin is, but also the future for your brand. I can't wait to see the face. I also want to invite you to come back on here and talk to you sometime because Anytime. we did not hear enough. And, Anytime, Paul. And I, I think I asked you two questions and you gave me two answers, and both of them lasted 50 minutes each. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I apologize. I, I hope it's been okay for you. Listen, mate. We have to have you back on. Thanks for your time. Give my regards to everybody. I really appreciate you and good luck with everything. Thank you so much, Paul. And thanks everybody for tuning in. It's, it's been fun. I've loved it. Thank you. Take care. Stay safe.